God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And to the Lord, uh, to the Lord be the glory. Uh, welcome to Orlando. What a joy it is to see you. I just wish it were possible to come out there and hug every one of you and tell you how much you're loved of God and how much you're loved by the Assemblies of God. And we've looked uh, with keen anticipation and much prayer to, for this week and for what the Lord is going to do in our lives. It's a special privilege of mine to take just a moment before I break God's word to recognize the past executive leadership of the Assemblies of God who is sitting on the front row. Dear friends of mine, dear friends of all of us who have served this church with such great distinction, I would like for them to stand and for you to give them a round of applause that acknowledges the great contribution they've made in our lives. Brother Trask, Brother Crabtree, Brother Bridges, Brother Stenhouse, Brother Hackett, we love you. We thank God for you. Thank you so much. Bless you. Tonight I hold in this hand the uh, official list of ministers and missionaries of the Assemblies of God. Pastors, ministers, evangelists, staff pastors, counselors, teachers, 34,000 names in all. How many of them do you know? And in the other hand, I take two volumes that many people are not aware that we keep, but in the General Council, there is a book of remembrance. And every two years, in it, in a handwritten form, is recorded the names of all the Assemblies of God ministers who have gone to be with the Lord in the last biennium. These two volumes contain the names of all the credentialed ministers of the Assemblies of God that have been credentialed with us since 1914 and have gone to be with the Lord. 13,500 names. You put those two together, the Book of the Living on Earth and the Book of the Living in Heaven. 48,000 names in all. How many of them do you know? I suspect not many. The overwhelming majority of the Lord's workers labor anonymously in his vineyard, often in lonely places. And this hall tonight is filled with thousands of people, but altogether, although we are in a crowd, each of us is an individual, and quite frankly, because of the size of the group, most of us are even unknown to one another. We have our triumphs and our struggles. And some of you are here this evening and wonder if you will ever have a breakthrough in your ministry. Others pass through a distressing time dealing with difficult personal and family issues. Even those who serve in the spotlight of being well known pass through seasons when you wonder if your life is really accomplishing all that it should or all that it could. I want to encourage you this evening by going to the story of one of the most obscure persons in the Bible. Her life was marked by tremendous adversity and I'm sure like many of us she wondered why the Lord put her on earth and gave her such a heavy load to carry. Her name is Leah and her story is told from Genesis 29 through 49. But her legacy plays out throughout the entire Bible, all the way through the book of Revelation, as we'll see. I want to use her life story this evening as an encouragement to all of us who belong to the household of faith. I suspect that most of us do not get all that we want from life. Leah certainly did not. Her name in Hebrew means weary, or tired, or even wild cow. Compare that name with Rachel, whose name means you, E-W-E, for female sheep. The word cow, as opposed to sheep, may suggest that Leah was not all that good looking. 
Genesis 29, 17, in fact, compares her to her younger sister, Rachel. Leah had weak eyes. Maybe she was nearsighted. Maybe, maybe she lacked the sparkle in her sister's eyes. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. And many of us see ourselves like Leah. Someone else is better, more attractive, or more charismatic. Someone else has better behaved children, a larger scope of ministry, enjoys greater favor, earns more money, has better health, sees greater results. For Jacob, Rachel was love at first sight. But Jacob the schemer is out-schemed by his uncle and future father-in-law Laban. Jacob agreed to work for Laban for seven years as payment for getting Rachel in marriage. But on the wedding night, Laban, by trickery, substitutes Leah for Rachel because of the local custom that the oldest daughter marries first. Since their tent had no electricity, and Leah was heavily veiled as she entered the tent on the wedding night, Jacob did not know that the switch had been made until the morning light. And the text explicitly says and records Jacob's shock. When morning came, there was Leah. Jacob rushes out to confront Laban. And Laban says, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you Rachel if you'll serve me another seven years. But first you have to complete the wedding week with Leah. Now how do you think Leah felt? She had been forced through custom to obey her father. She had given herself to Jacob and then had to endure two indignities. Jacob did not want her. And one week after their marriage, he takes up with Leah's younger sister in a second marriage. And all Leah could do is stand by and say nothing. The text explicitly says Jacob lay with Rachel also and he loved, he loved Rachel more than Leah. My picture of Leah is of a very hurt, shamed, embarrassed, depressed young woman crying alone in the tent, suffering the pain of a father who traded her and rejection from the man she loved. Is life fair for Leah? Not on your life. The circumstances in Leah's life were not within her control. Her looks were against her. Her younger sister was more captivating. Her husband had sex with her but did not love her. And now you may be thinking, where is this general counsel message going? <laughs> be patient, I'll get there. Rachel was infertile, and after a while, Jacob turned to Leah. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a boy whose name Reuben means, behold, a son. Leah expressed the essence of his name this way in Genesis 29:32. It is because it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. He didn't. And she conceived again. This time she bears a second son, Simeon, whose name means heard, H E A R D. She explained it this way. Because the Lord has heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. Notice her description of the Lord. The Lord sees. The Lord hears. She still was not loved after giving birth to two sons, and she conceived again. This time she bore Levi, whose name means attached. Her explanation for the third son was, Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. But that didn't work either. By the time her fourth son is born, she seems to have given up on Jacob loving her. And so she names the boy Judah, whose name means praise. 
Her reason for this name is simply stated, this time, this time, I will praise the Lord. Please, please notice her faith. Each time a son is born, she refers to the Lord. The Lord hears. The Lord sees. This time I will praise the Lord. Her circumstances may have brought her misery, may have brought her a lack of family love, but her view of God continued to be one of trust. She is like a female Job who says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Leah's younger sister, Rachel, will steal her father's household idols when they packed up and left for Haran. But Leah has no part of it. Leah's love for the one true God is unadulterated. She has great purity of faith. What purity of faith it is for us that our trust in God leads us to abandon any contingency planning, any compromise, any reliance on schemes or devices of our own that would dilute our confidence that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. After the fourth son is born to Leah, Rachel gets so upset that she is barren that she gives Jacob, her servant, Bilhah, and two sons are born, Dan and Naphtali. And not to be outdone, Leah's womb, whom God had now closed, is opened again and or through Zilpah, Leah's servant, to whom two more sons are born, Gad and Asher. This is beginning to sound like a modern TV reality show. Then God reopens Leah's womb and she bears two more sons, Issachar and Zebulun and a daughter Dinah. Finally, Rachel has Joseph and dies in Bethlehem bearing the twelfth son of Jacob, Benjamin. But Leah outlives Rachel. We're not told when Leah died, but we do know she was buried in the cave of Machpelah at Hebron. And it was in that cave where Jacob's grandma and grandpa, Abraham and Sarah, and where his mom and dad, Isaac and Rebekah, were buried. In fact, if you look at Jacob's dying words when he's giving instructions about the disposition of his estate and his body, he says in Genesis 49:31 of Leah and the cave of Machpelah in Hebron, there... I buried Leah. He leaves instructions as to where he wants to be buried. Not, not with Rachel at Bethlehem, but with Leah in Hebron. In the end, Leah has won Jacob's love. There's a popular Israeli song today, and I have some Israeli friends here today. Uh, it's called, I Love Thee, Leah. It has Jacob singing this refrain. Here many days have gone by and my two hands have become weary and your two eyes have become beautiful like the eyes of Rachel. I love thee, Leah. I love thee proud. If I forget thee, Leah, my name shall not be Israel. But looking back, we are tempted to say of Leah, what a tragic and a difficult life. So many people in life were unfair to her. Her father forced her into marriage. Her sister resented her. Her husband did not begin to love her until too late. Yet Leah's story teaches us that the effect of your life cannot be measured within the time span of the few decades you have on earth. Leah's story, like all of yours, fits into a longer range tapestry of God's weaving. The priestly line comes through Levi's third son, Levi. And in that line, the line of Leah through Levi comes Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Without Leah, 
There is no Levi. There is no Moses. There are no first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There are no Ten Commandments. There is no Exodus from Egypt. There is no prototype of a high priest upon which Jesus would model his intercessory ministry for us. Leah's descendant, Caleb, was only one of two who entered the promised land of Canaan after Israel had wandered 40 years in the wilderness because of disobedience. And at age 85, hey, most of us in this room have got a way to go yet. At the age of 85, 45 years after Israel's failure to enter the promised land, Caleb says, I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go to battle now as I was then. Give me this hill country that the Lord has promised me. I hope at 95 years of age, the Assemblies of God is saying the same thing. Give us this country. Give us this city. Give us this community. Give us this church. I think Caleb had the spiritual, the same spiritual genetic makeup and tenacity as Leah. Never give up, never give in, and never sit down in self-pity, resignation, or defeat. Centuries later, the elders of Bethlehem pronounce a blessing on Boaz, another descendant of Leah. Boaz becomes the great-grandfather of David. And on the day Boaz redeems Ruth for his bride, the elders say to him in Ruth 4.11, at the last mention of Leah in the Bible, May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. But Leah did far more to build up the house of Israel than did Rachel. It was Leah's fourth son, Judah, who became the ancestor of King David and King Solomon. Without Leah, we have no Judah. Without Judah, we have no Boaz, no David, no Solomon. And without David or Solomon, we do not have the Psalms, the Proverbs, the Song of Songs, or Ecclesiastes. And from Leah comes not only all the high priests, the priests and the Levites of Israel, but also all the kings of Judah, including Asaph, Jehoshaphat, Uzziah, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Additionally... Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel all appear to be priests and therefore descended from Leah. And Ezra the scribe was a priest and thus from Leah. Nehemiah in all probability was from Judah and therefore also a descendant of Leah. And ultimately the key players in the Christmas story derived from Leah. Mary and Joseph belonged to Judah, the fourth son of Leah. Elizabeth and Zechariah belonged to Levi, the third son of Leah. And their son, John the Baptist, likewise, comes from Leah. And Anna, Anna the old woman in the temple who gave thanks to God upon seeing the baby Jesus and spoke about him to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel, she was from the tribe of Asher. Asher came from Leah through Leah's servant Zilpah. And the land of Zebulun, the sixth and last son of Leah, included Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. And Nazareth was among the first to see the great light shining in the darkness. In summary, without Leah there is no Judah, and without Judah there is no David, and without David there is no Jesus, and without Jesus there is no salvation. The people of the Christmas story are mainly Leah's kids. Without Leah, we could not sing, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. And the spread of the gospel, the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles also comes through another of Leah's descendants, Barnabas, a descendant of Levi. And who do you think raised Benjamin? The boy that was born as his mother, Rachel, died. It was none other than Leah who took him in and raised him as her own. And from Benjamin comes the first king, Saul, and the New Testament apostle, Paul. Would Paul even have existed had Leah failed to nurture and raise Benjamin? You, you see, you cannot, you cannot measure the impact of Leah's life within her earthly time span. And you cannot measure your own life that way either. Neither can you judge things by external appearances. Rachel was the good-looking one, but God looks deeper than the outward appearance. 
Leah had an inner beauty that the scheming, envious, and petulant Rachel did not have. Theologian Abraham Kuyper put it this way, There are two kinds of beauty. There is a beauty which God gives at birth and which withers as a flower. And there is a beauty which God grants. That kind of beauty never vanishes but blooms eternally. Leah had the beauty that never withered. And may we have a beauty that never withers. What can we take away from her story? We need time and we need distance to understand what God is doing through your life. Leah had no idea that her trials would result ultimately in a priestly and kingly line and that a great deal of the Bible would have been left unwritten without her. Most of all, she had no idea that the Savior of the world on the human side would ultimately descend from her DNA. All of us have probably by now seen the photo of the approximate 300 who formed the Assemblies of God in Hot Springs, Arkansas in 1914. We do have the names uh, for about 250 of them, but only a handful. I can think of Ian e. Bell, J. Roswell Flower, Ralph Riggs, who was 16. That's the only ones out of the 300 and even the 250 that are named that I even know or probably any of us know. The overwhelming majority of that original group are God's anonymous saints. Do they realize at the time they formed that a vast worldwide movement would spring out of their anonymity? That a fellowship would be created on which the sun never sets? In which 300,000 of some of the God churches with over 600 million adherents gather each week to worship the Lord? And if the Lord tarries at the present rate of growth, by the year 2020, the Assemblies of God will number 500,000 churches and 100 million believers. They didn't see that coming. Those early pioneers were people of faith. But I doubt that they saw any of this, any more than Leah could see what was coming from her. They struggled to get the work of the Lord going. They preached on street corners. They preached in the most difficult places imaginable, rented halls, tent meetings, brush arbors, basements, garages, church buildings across the tracks. They were despised by many and shunned by the church world of their day, but they were full of the Holy Spirit. Love for Jesus and the fire of Pentecost burned in their hearts. They did not seek what was in it for them. They sought what was in it for the King. And they laid the foundations of belief and behavior upon which this church stands today. Only a few ever get into the spotlight. It is God's great army of anonymous saints who build His kingdom. And what you do matters. The enemy will say to you, it doesn't matter. People may say to you, it doesn't matter. You may get criticized by others for what you do, but what you do for Jesus matters. It matters to you. It matters to God. It matters to your family. It matters to your church. And it matters to generations to come if the trumpet of the Lord doesn't sound first. I'm very conscious that there are many here tonight that may be in a place of ministry or life where you are struggling. Like Leah, you've done your best, but life is not as complete as you wish it to be. Don't lose heart. You've not lived long enough to see the rest of the story. People in your ancestral line before you probably went through some very tough days, but you're here today because of them. And the choices you make today will impact others long after you are gone. In my book, Core Values, I talked about my parents' experience of planting a church in Jeffersonville, Indiana in the 1950s. And I've had the privilege of sharing that story various times, but I wanted to share it again this evening. Two and a half years of my life were spent there when I was between the ages of 13 and 15, a small town across the river, Ohio River from Louisville, Kentucky. Those years were incredibly formative years for me. 
It was in the little mission we had in Jeffersonville, Indiana, that I was baptized in water and that I had my entrance into ministry by teaching my first Sunday school class, a group of uh, four- and five-year-olds. My job was to keep them quiet on the back two rows. We flipped the next to last bench. I had a shoebox that had cardboard flannel graph uh, characters that I glued in during the week and had a little hole in it. And if the kids were good and the rest of the classes could function in that church, at the end of the Sunday school hours, the kids could look through the people and see the Bible characters. That was before MTV. My parents had returned home from being missionaries in China and Tibet a few years earlier. In fact, mom had gone out as a missionary to northwest China in the year 1924 when she was a single woman, 26 years of age. The Assemblies of God was only 10 years of age, but by 1924 it had hundreds of missionaries out on foreign soil. And if I could say a word to pastors just for a moment, a word of admonition and encouragement. I realize we're in a recession, but as I pointed out in the report of the state of the church, the uh, church of the 20s and through 29 and 39 was in a great recession. If they had pulled back their commitment to missions during that time, we would not be seeing the incredible harvest all over the world that we are seeing today. And we must not pull back now. And we must also be careful to balance solid missionary theology against the quick fix in fundraising. We all know it is easier to raise funds for projects and to send people from our churches to mission fields, and we need to do that. But boots on the ground is how this indigenous church has popped up in 213 countries worldwide. And I want to encourage you to support our missionary family because it is Jesus, when he came, brought himself. And the best gift we can give is the gift of persons who live in the country, learn the language, learn the culture, and help build the church of Jesus Christ within that context. But I look back upon those days. My mother's support was $50 a month. My mom served seven and a half years in northwest China, came home, began itinerating in 1932 to go back for her second term, met my dad, who was itinerating to go for his first term, and they began to court, and then they courted some more on the boat, the slow boat going to China, and... uh, Mom was 20, mom was 34, dad was 24, my older brother and sister are here. I have to say that because I look older than them. I'm actually 39 years of age. I share with various people I have an, adva- I have an advancing aging disease. Uh, but but dad was, dad was thir- 24, mom was 34. But they were the only two single missionaries going to Northwest China from the Assemblies of God. So the law of propinquity kicked in. You marry who's near you. When they finally came home from China in 1949, I was a boy. They had to leave because the communists had taken over. For the rest of their ministry, like so many in this auditorium, like so many that are listening via the internet across this nation who could not afford to come here, as a kid growing up in the Assemblies of God, I only went to one general council. My parents simply could not afford to come to general council. My parents pastored small, struggling churches. Sometimes churches were the only form of entertainment permitted the saints was the annual vote on the pastor. They came to Jeffersonville because they were out of a church. They couldn't seem to find a pastor anywhere, so they concluded that God must be calling them to plant another church. And they worked hard in Jeffersonville. I was mostly at home with them in those years because I am the youngest child and and my sister Doris and brother Paul had already gone to school or married. To support the church and to support our family, dad took a job in a factory across the river in Louisville, worked hard eight hours a day. I remember in the hot summer months, dad coming home and laying down on the floor of our little living room. We lived in a back rooms in back of the little sanctuary, the mission. Mom would put a circular fan uh, by his head to kind of cool him down. We couldn't afford air conditioning. Dad would stretch out on the floor, gain his strength. Dad was never strong physically. After he'd rested for maybe an hour or two, he'd get up, and we'd eat a simple meal, 
and then mom and dad would go out knocking on doors and invite people to their little church. I took a paper out to help support and pay for my own way. And mom, who by then was in her late 50 and had no vocational training, uh, took an Avon route to supplement the family income. I can still remember my mom coming home with that Avon bag slung over her shoulder and being a smart alecky teenager and knowing that lipstick was forbidden in those days. It's interesting, we forbid red lips, but preachers wore red ties. I never could figure that out as a kid. That always was a mystery to me. But I would say to my mother, Mother, you've been out pushing that lipstick again like it was some drug. And uh, she would get very defensive, and I can still see her sort of square her shoulders and say, No, Georgie, I'm not pushing lipstick. If people ask for it, I sell it. But Avon has many other fine products. <laughs> Mom and Dad could never get more than a handful of adults in that congregation. My parents paid the bills for the church. And after two and a half years of that, my dad's health broke, and we left. I can never remember the rest of their lives. I can never remember my parents ever even mentioning the word Jeffersonville again. They had successfully planted churches in Traverse City, Michigan, and in uh, Ravenna, Ohio, which exists today. They planted a church in northwest China, which today has over 15,000 adult baptized believers. But Jeffersonville was their failure. After we left Jeffersonville, two other Summons God pastors tried for a very short time to get the work going, but they couldn't get it going either. And so the district sold the church to a woman minister who bought the building. And God gave success. Now, 50 plus years later, at the age of 91, that woman, Reverend Bernice Hicks, is still going strong with a thoroughly Pentecostal congregation in Jeffersonville that sprung out of Chestnut and Graham. That congregation has 3,000 people with, and has planted over 2,000 churches worldwide. I've had the great privilege of preaching for Reverend Hicks several times over the past years. Every time it's been an emotional, overwhelming experience for me. I just, I just stand on that platform and uh, waiting during the worship service to preach and just weep. I, my great regret is my parents could not have lived to see it. This past March I was at Christ's Gospel again and uh, that Sunday night after the service, I received a remarkable and instantaneous healing of a torn retina. And I talk about that in my book, Living in the Spirit. But that March evening, with the, with the, with the retina, uh, a film coming across my, it was on my left eye, a film coming, uh, a steady trickle coming across my left eye. As I was on the platform, waiting to be introduced, I was thinking again, as I have every time I've been in Jeffersonville. Why did mom and dad fail here and Sister Hicks succeed? I'm glad she succeeded, but I never could figure out why they had failed. And as I was thinking that, immediately the Spirit of God said to me, your parents kept knocking on the wall of Jeffersonville. It was a hard wall spiritually. They knocked hard. They knocked repeatedly. Their knuckles hurt from the knocking, but they never broke through. They left, and the spiritually hard wall still stood. Sister Hicks came. She put her small fist to the wall, knocked once, and broke through. And the Spirit said to me, what happened? What happened, George? Your mom and dad spiritually weakened the wall. If they had not weakened the wall, she could not have broken through. What the Lord said to me in that moment is so consistent with what the Apostle Paul said. Some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. Don't be weary in doing well. In God's season, you will reap if you faint not. Are you knocking hard on the spiritual wall of your town? Are you knocking hard on the spiritual wall of your community? Are you knocking hard on the spiritual wall of your ministry? And you haven't yet seen the results that you long for and you pray for. Don't be disheartened. Keep knocking. You are weakening the wall and the breakthrough will come.
It'll come from you. It'll come through someone else. But God will not forget your work. Great reward awaits both the reaper and the sower. In Jeffersonville, Indiana, I saw the power of my parents' faith in God and their service to Christ. They were not in the ministry for fame or fortune. They gave their best for Jesus. And if you could go back in time warp and tell them that, that teenager, that red-headed boy is watching you. Seize your attitude. Seize your heart for God. Seize your uncomplaining service. He is watching you. And he is going to be touched by your life. And he's going to go into the ministry. And someday, he is going to be the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God and the chairman of the World Assemblies of God Fellowship. They would have leaped for joy. They wouldn't have believed it. And sometimes I don't either. But like Leah... We can't see down the road. We can't see down the years. Yet the choices that we make are impacting others. Many of you have young children. Many of you have teenagers. And many of you parents are in difficult churches and in difficult places. Many of you watching as this is live streamed out across the nation and the world. Missionaries in hard countries and hard areas. You have children. And you think, you know, I'm not... I'm not having the breakthrough in my ministry that I want. If God is not expanding you wide, He may be expanding you deep. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. By the way, uh, Leah's name also had an Assyrian meaning. Instead of the Hebrew meaning of wild cow or weary, it can mean mistress of the manor or ruler, a queen, a princess, a wonder woman. God made something beautiful out of her life, and he seeks that, so seeks to do that with you and me. One interesting fact gives us the exclamation point to Leah's story. And I just, I, when I saw this in the Bible, as I was preparing for this message, I just, I just was overwhelmed with joy. In Revelation 21, we learn that the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are given to the 12 gates of the New Jerusalem. And each gate is made from a single pearl. Do you know how pearls are formed? The formation of a natural pearl begins when a foreign substance slips into the oyster between the mantle and the shell, and it irritates the mantle. It's kind of like the oyster gets a splinter. And the oyster's natural reaction is to cover up, to cover up the irritant to protect itself. The mantle covers the irritant with layers of the same mother of pearl substance that is used to create the shell, and that eventually forms the pearl. An angel is stationed at each of these gates that are made from a single pearl. And it's through those gates that we enter heaven. And Leah's kids, Leah's kids have their names on half the gates. So someday, you and I may be walking through the gate of Reuben, the gate of Simeon, the gate of Levi, the gate of Judah, the gate of Issachar, or the gate of Zebulun. Leah suffered much through the incredible irritations that entered her life, things she did not ask for, things she did not want, but six of heaven's pearly gates stand as tribute to the good that emerged from her life. And heaven obviously has some rather large pearls if a gate can be made from a single pearl. Remember that great pearls come out of great pain. Leah's lifelong suffering eventually leads to eternal grandeur. What will stand in heaven? What will stand in heaven is a tribute to what you are going through. What pearls, what pearls will be fashioned from the adverse and painful circumstances of your life? Leah began marriage with a husband who didn't love her, but she never stopped loving him. And in the end, he loved her more. But you and I are different from her in this respect. From day one, the Lord has always loved you. And he will love you all the way through to the very end. He is, he is here. He, the living Lord, 
is here this evening to tell you, don't let difficulty or hardship or sickness or sorrow upend you. Your life, your ministry has meaning and purpose. Don't fret that right now you cannot see the whole picture. God does, and He will not leave you or forsake you. I ask again, what will stand in heaven as a tribute to what you are going through? When I was a boy and I was worried or upset about something, I would go to my mother, and she would always pat me on my curly red hair. Yes, believe it or not, it was there in those days, and in the resurrection it's coming back. She would always run her fingers through my hair and she would pat me on the head and she would say, Now, Georgie, it won't matter a hundred years from now. And she was right. One hundred years from now, it won't matter whether you drive an expensive or a cheap car, whether you live in a mansion or a rented room, whether you buy your clothes from Nordstrom or from Goodwill. It will not matter whether you pastored a large church or a small one, whether you preached to thousands or a handful, whether you had a public platform or ministered individually as a counselor or a chaplain. What will matter a hundred years from now is the legacy of your life that you pass on to others. That's what matters. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Our Father, we come to this moment in our lives, bringing our life to you and asking you that through the prism of Leah's experience, we might have the means to evaluate our own life. There are many in this auditorium who have experienced unfairness, difficulty, sorrow, sickness, and trouble, whose goals have not been achieved, and who find a difference between their dreams and their actual realities. You know each heart, and you know each life, and by the power of the Holy Spirit this evening, and because the entrance of your word gives life, we trust that now as we come to these moments of prayer, the Holy Spirit will reveal himself in a personal and individual way. For although we are in a vast crowd of people tonight, the Holy Spirit is speaking to each of us personally and individually and has ministry for us. So I pray in these sacred moments we may be sensitive to respond to your spirit. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask that no one leave the auditorium or no one move in the aisles for a moment, except I would like to ask the General Presbytery and their spouses to begin slipping out of their seats and to form a line all across the front and all around to the sides, because I'm going to invite you to come to the elders of this fellowship this evening and to be prayed for. And the Lord has put upon my heart several requests of you this evening. First of all, you may be here and everything is just going great in your life. I want us all just to take a moment and audibly lift our voice in praise to the, the Lord for His goodness to us. Would you do that? Just all over this auditorium. Just lift your voice in thanksgiving to the Lord for all His goodness to you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for life. We thank you for meaning and for purpose. We thank you that we are not in the darkness, but we belong to Jesus. We thank you that we know there is a God to love and serve. We praise you and we glorify your name. We thank you, Lord. Now, secondly, you may be here this evening and you've not committed your life to Jesus Christ. Or perhaps you've fallen away from him. Maybe somebody else discouraged you. Maybe you just got discouraged. I don't know. But the Lord is here to meet with you this evening. And here's the cry of your heart. And I would just invite you. In your heart right now as I'm talking say, Lord Jesus, will you come into my life? Will you forgive my sins? Will you be my Savior? Will you be my Lord? And if you're praying that prayer from your heart. You need somebody else to pray with you about that. And I'd like you to come and one of these brothers or sisters who are spiritual leaders will pray with you. Then thirdly, many of you 
have come this evening and you are battling with illnesses in your body. We've been praying that the Holy Spirit will come with a wave of healing across this auditorium this evening. And I want you to come in faith. I've asked the general presbyters and their wives to have anointing oil with them and for them to pray the prayer of faith over you. And then, forth, if you're discouraged and you're having a tough season in your life and could take the strengthening prayer of a brother or sister, I want you to come. Would you stand? Tom and the team is going to lead us just gently in a, in a chorus of worship about Jesus be the center. And, and would you respond? We're here to see God work at the close of this service. And I want you just to begin streaming toward the front, toward these sides. Find a brother or sister who will lay hands upon you. Let them hear what is on your heart first. And then let them pray the prayer of faith and minister to you. God is here to meet you. God is, how many of you believe that? God is here to break chains. He's here to set free. He's here. We pray this general council will not be just going through the motions of a big meeting and seeing friends and having business. But this will be a general council in which we will experience anew the power of God in our life. Jesus is here. Jesus is here to minister to you. All along the sides, the general presbytery has fanned out. Would you come as we sing? sing, we can pray. Let's take some moments and wait upon the Lord and wait in His presence.
take a moment now without any music all over this sanctuary. Could we lift our voice in praise? Could we make this place a sanctuary of prayer? Oh, Holy Spirit, we call upon you, Lord, the assembly of God. We are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. We pray to you, Lord. We worship you. We exalt in your name. Glorify your name in the midst of your people. Praise be under your name. Praise be under your name. We worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray for those who have come here this evening and are at the front and receiving prayers from, Lord, all of us that are behind them or in front of them. We lift our hands. We lift our voices. We ask, Lord Jesus, that every need will be met in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, we gather our faith together and we ask for breakthroughs in the spiritual realm. We ask for healings, Lord. We ask for your grace to be outpoured. We ask for the strength of your power to be manifest among us as we gather in your name. Holy Spirit of God, we wait upon you. We thank you. We praise you. You are here. Jesus is here. And we praise you. We worship you from our hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We lift our voice, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We worship you, Lord. We glorify you. Oh, hallelujah. 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 We praise you, Lord. We lift our voice to you. We lift our hearts to you. We praise you and we bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name, Lord. Blessed be your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Oh, we tarry in your presence, Lord.
praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't we all just take a moment and just praise the Lord in a language we know or a language we don't know and lift our voice in praise to the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit fill your heart. Perhaps it's been a while or perhaps you've never received the baptism of the Spirit right where you're standing tonight. You just open your heart to the Lord and let the Holy Spirit give utterance through you and begin to praise Him and begin to exalt Him and begin to magnify Him. He is here. He is here. We praise you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise your name. 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 Share together in the Lord's presence as we begun this council. And may in these coming days together, we not only have the opportunity to remove so many friendships that we have from across the country and conduct things that need to be done, but that we savor together the Lord's presence. As you leave uh, tonight, I have a little gift for you as you go out the doors. It's a little copy of this message, Your Life, Your Legacy. And we trust that in printed form, it will be a blessing to your life. If you'd like to stay and continue to pray, you're welcome. I'd like for us to close with the anthem of the Assemblies of God. 
I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. And when we get, we'll sing the first and the last verse. When we come to the last verse, let's sing the amen, shall we? All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the tomorrow morning. God bless you.